So good morning. Uh, it's um, it's really a pleasure and an honor to have with us uh, today, uh, Ung Joon Scott Lee. Um, and uh, um, uh, who is partner in the world leading practice Morphosis Architects, uh, led by uh, the Pritzker Prize winning architect Tom Main. Uh, Unju Scott Lee is a, uh, is, uh, has uh, 19 years experience in the field. Uh, he's a licensed architect registered in uh, several states, New York State, uh, New Jersey and Texas. Uh, raised in Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, Scott began his tenure at Morphosis in 1996 and has contributed to many of the firm's um, uh, significant projects. In addition to running daily operations for Morphosis's New York office, Scott serving as the project principal for Casablanca Finance City Tower in 2017 and the Bloomberg Center, which will which will be presenting today, completed in uh, 2017. Bloomberg Center is a uh, aspires to net zero um, in terms of energy. Uh, it is lead platinum, um, and uh, it's the main academic building for the new Cornell Tech campus uh, in Roosevelt Island in New York. Um, we're grateful for your generosity and, and your time to join us this morning. This is the fourth of six uh, recorded sessions of presentations and interviews in this graduate MARC seminar. We're researching uh, the frontiers of technology and its impact on architectural practice uh, in this uh, seminar at New York Institute of Technology. Uh, and we explore six modalities of practice, each working at the frontiers uh, of design, production, and construction technology. Uh, the focus is on the architectural envelope of, or the skin uh, primarily, but uh, we look at the buildings also holistically. Uh, the six buildings and the six themes we're looking at of materiality and massing, the 014 tower by Raizu Momoto, modularity and mass customization, uh, through the Taekwun Center in Hong Kong by Herzog Demeron, form and geometry uh, in relation to the uh, Lisa Soho building by Zaha Deed Architects, visuality and experience um, uh, uh, with the Galleria Center City by UN Studio in Seoul, and uh, interaction and smartness, the Media Tick building in Barcelona by Claude Mellon. Uh, the corresponding building uh, of uh, our theme climate and energy is the Bloomberg Center uh, this week's session, uh, which is an exemplary project in this light, uh, aspiring to net zero in energy terms and, and with a range of climatic uh, HVAC and energy systems. Thank you very much for joining us today, Scott. We're grateful you can uh, make time for our session on the Bloomberg Session uh, Center, uh, and uh, I'm pleased to introduce your presentation, uh, and our students will be interviewing you informally afterwards. Thank you very much. That sounds good. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're just talking about hopefully you guys are all hanging in there. It's been a tough semester. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, so yeah, uh, so uh, I think I'm going to focus, I have a little intro to the office uh, that's a little connected to my own sort of personal experience and also the Bloomberg Center. Uh, there is a lot of things to cover on the Bloomberg Center, but I think within the theme of the studio, uh, I'm going to focus on two things, which is this kind of concept of the edge that has to do with the uh, photovoltaic canopy. It's become such a part and feature of the building. Uh, in terms of both its sort of identity, but also in terms of its performance. And then the other one, uh, I think a bit closer to Tom, to the studio facade surface idea is this sort of theme on the surface, which is the vertical patterning uh, of the Bloomberg Center. So uh, having said that, just a, a few slides about uh, where I'm coming from, where my office is coming from. Uh, we're a studio-based office, and we really uh, focus on design. Uh, we, we really think that design is, uh, quote unquote, the core uh, of our work. That's the core of our business. Uh, we're really, really fortunate to work uh, across uh, different time zones, different culture, different typologies. So we don't consider ourselves to be, let's say, healthcare people or, you know, education, uh, university building people. Uh, we're just uh, architects who are interested in participating uh, in anything, whether it's urban planning or designing a product. Uh, so we're sort of coming um, from every sort of different background. So 
uh, as Tom did my uh, a quick intro, that really resonated to me because uh, I myself uh, I'm one of those crazy people that kind of immigrated twice in my li- in my lifetime. I was born in Korea. Uh, when I was very young, my parents immigrated to, to Brazil for sort of better times. Uh, and then eventually we immigrated again to the U.S. Uh, so uh, wanting to sort of work in a, in, a, in a place that kind of worked through the different cultures was uh, quite important to me. Uh, we have two main offices. We have a few offices scattered throughout the world. Uh, I would say that the Culver City is our sort of mothership. And then I work in the New York office, which is the second largest uh, office. We have a few sort of different satellite offices in Asia, but those are really particular to uh, sort of project-driven uh, offices. And I think uh, a lot of the environment is just like your environment. Uh, it's completely open, uh, very transparent. Communication and articulation of ideas is really key to what we do. So being able to kind of talk about the work and describe the work is such a vital piece of what we need to do. And if there's, uh, in the context of your last year and getting your MARC, uh, I think that's one aspect that I'd say, uh, as you leave university, is really important. It's your ability to kind of give the story and narrative around your ideas. You know, we, we speak graphically, but we also communicate through, through the language of words. So really kind of understanding that uh, is, is really important. Uh, our office in Culver City, uh, again, it's, it's our mothership. It's in, uh, uh, we, we actually purpose built the building. We were in a different warehouse for many years, and recently we moved into a place that we sort of uh, built out. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very kind of simple building in the sense that it is a shed, but what's kind of cool about it is that it's a place where we can build and try things. So what you see there stuck on the facade of our building are actually uh, prototypes for some of the building facades that we've worked on. You know, uh, When we're designing, we're constantly struggle around simple concepts like scale, like how big are things or what does it look like? How does it look like under shadow and light? So having the ability to have a place where you can do kind of large scale work to really understand it outside of the computer box was really, really important for us. So we sort of purpose built something uh, to give us that ability. Uh, Interior to that, once again, it's a pretty uh, open space. Again, not very different from a lot of kind of architecture schools. Uh, We literally don't have any offices. And in fact, if you sort of look at the very end here, uh, when Tom Main shows up to work, that's where he's sort of stationed. Uh, he's just one guy amongst uh, all of us. Um, and connected to the Bloomberg Center uh, project, the building was also designed to be a net zero building. So uh, it was interesting in the sense that we got a slightly different perspective in building performance and how we kind of lay out certain things in a very simple way, but in a very efficient way t- from, a, from a mechanical point of view. You know, so uh, photovoltaics over the driveway, fairly simple thing to do. It didn't take much. And one of the biggest features that we used uh, because we have limited money and resources to to build something is we did a very simple um, uh, passive cooling system. It's what we use this kind of wind catcher. So uh, by doing that, it decreased our air conditioning to almost zero. And then uh, we used uh, a lot of daylight to be able to provide uh, indirect light into the space. So again, through very simple moves, uh, we were able to get to a net zero office. And it's a little bit embarrassing almost to say this, but I believe our office is the largest net zero building uh, in the LA County area, which is really like an odd thing to say, but I, I only say it because it's a fairly easy thing to do, right? When you kind of think through that way. So. Uh, going into, uh, the, into the project, the Bloomberg Center, we already had a bit of a mentality, at least from an owner side, to what it meant right, to really kind of work on a net zero building. Uh, that's the physical space. I think, as you all guys know, this probably looks scaringly familiar to all of you, which are these days endless Zooms. We now call, you know, we, we always introduce us as having two main offices. We now just say we have X offices. X is a variable because any time in the day, there's constant meeting, meetings going on over Zoom. And it's sort of New York, Los Angeles, and anywhere. Uh, just before we started, Tom, we were speaking about how difficult and sort of exhausting it's now been going through this, uh, but it's been amazingly successful. 
because we have some of the infrastructure stuff to kind of help us with it. But we really miss uh, doing this kind of stuff. We really do. Uh, because for us as architects, we are hands-on. Uh, we, we live in a physical environment, in physical space. Uh, the process of model building for our studio is probably very central to the design process. Uh, so not being able to really do this um, has been very difficult uh, for us. Um, we use models as not only ways to kind of understand sort of conceptual underpinning of projects, but we also use model as tools to, to sort of discern uh, constructability. So the only way we can sort of work through that in a model setting is we build big stuff. Uh, because by building big stuff, it actually requires you to actually build a foundation for this model, build a facade, build a structure, build the enclosure, and kind of flush out certain themes of how do you detail that uh, through, through these very large scale models. And ultimately, uh, for us, it's not about concept and then just the building. We don't like to hand off our projects to, let's say, like a local or executive architect, and then we show up for the ribbon cutting. Uh, we always want to follow the process a bit because we think that the model that you see here uh, ultimately is no different than the model that you see here, which is the actuality of an actual building, right? It's one single sort of phenomena for us. So we like to talk about concepts. We like to talk about theory, but ultimately we like to be builders. Uh, we like to build things. Uh, we like to talk shop. We, love, we like to talk about details. And in that sense, I have an amazing kind of group of staff who can talk about projects both in their sort of conceptual and theoretical level, but uh, on a very sort of a uh, quick turn, we can talk about waterproofing details, right? And uh, thermal bridging and thermal breaks and that kind of thing. So that's kind of a very important piece for us and how we like to think about buildings. So that takes me with that sort of context and background a bit. Uh, then he takes us to the actual Bloomberg Center project. Uh, if we could do this in person, maybe we could have actually been there because it's probably not very far for a lot of us. It's in Roosevelt Island, which, uh, which is uh, it's a little bit of an odd place. And frankly, I never went to Roosevelt Island before this project. I didn't even know it sort of existed. I know it existed, but I only heard of, about it. It's sort of uh, locked between Manhattan's uh, east side and, and sort of Brooklyn and Queens. Um, and the site is at the very southern tip of Roosevelt Island. So what you see there in the picture right in the foreground is the uh, uh, Roosevelt Memorial recently completed. It's a beautiful little spot. If you haven't been there, please, please go there. I would say it's probably one of the sort of most undervalued, underrated spaces in the entire Manhattan. It's an amazing view. It's a beautiful spot and you can totally like zen out. If you're stressed out, go down there and hang out there for like an hour. You, you're going to come back like very, everything will be clear in your mind. Uh, and the, route, the the Cornell Tech campus is just north of that. So this is before the hospital uh, was taken out. Uh, the hospital uh, was already slated to be demolished before the, camp, the Tech campus took place. Um, and, uh, and Roosevelt Island historically, uh, was a place where they put all the unwanted. So if you were sick uh, or if you had to go to jail, uh, that is the history of Roosevelt Island. So uh, through the years, it's gone through like amazing, an amazing historical cycle. You can now go there and you could never get that uh, perception. Of course, there's residentials and what have you. It also has the only landmark building uh, in New York that is a ruin. And that's the smallpox hospital. So it's sort of right there if you're if you go visit the, the place. So the joke for us was always that, you know, uh, Roosevelt Island was a place where they put all the mad people. And now they're just putting the mad people back again because these are all computer technologists and PhDs and that type. So that was our joke, uh, which the dean also loved. Uh, so. Uh, one of the sort of most amazing experiences in this project that we had was when usually a client comes over to us and asks us, they need a building, they always give you parameters, right? And the parameters are always schedule and the cost. So these are the two things, architect, please go and sort of figure it out. In the instance of Cornell Tech, 
we had uh, one parameter, here's a schedule, but the second one was net zero. So they asked us, you know, let's not talk about necessarily the cost first, but let's talk about how do you create a building that doesn't consume energy or it consumes energy and we can generate that amount of energy on site. So what we always uh, are, are we had we did have an agenda uh, going into the project, which was we were interested in understanding a net zero typology. In other words, do net zero buildings look alike? Do they have similar features? And could there be something that kind of creates an equalness to all net zero buildings because they're all based on certain kind of basic parameters and fundamentals? We were interested in that. However, we were actually more interested in how to make the building a typology, but also make a building that's both dynamic, but also differentiated in the sense that we didn't want the building to look like other buildings, or we didn't want this building to look like every net zero building, because we thought that there were more issues than just the net zero building. It's about campus planning. It's about space making. It's about public space. It was about the identity of the building and it was about teaching spaces for a different kind of tech collaboration kind of spaces. So we weren't uh, pursuing a generic, we were pursuing a specificity just as much. So I use this kind of slide to make that point. Uh, it's something that actually changes and it's very particular to where we are at the moment that we are working on and what they needed in terms of its site and program that kind of drove the entire form of the building and the way we really kind of talked or thought about the building. Uh, as a quick sort of tangent to the conversation, we had an experience of doing a very large building in San Francisco about 30 years ago or so. Uh, it wasn't uh, a net zero building because it didn't have space uh, to create energy on site, but it was mostly sort of a passive building. Uh, this is a project, it, it was mid nineties and it was even being uh, talked about before even like the lead stuff came up, right? It was like in the very early stages when people even talked about sustainability. And what it made us think at that time was the building initially as a program was very low and fat. And what we quickly figured out is that to make the building work passively, it had to be more like an European floor plate. It had to be a little bit taller and you had to be skinnier because by skinning it up, you could capture and harvest daylighting and you could allow for air movement to go through the floor plates. But so the, the concept was it's a flat building, but then very quickly through this kind of passive thinking, it immediately changed the entire form factor of the building. It sort of became a tower because of the need to be able to do that. And then the facade in this project was an equivalent, I would say, as a jacket. It was a shading device that we used it. And through that sort of form factor play and the surface and the materiality, we were able to take all the air conditioning out of the building, which was at that time a pretty significant big deal to, to a building at this scale. Uh, so that was sort of another historical thing that we definitely brought into the Bloomberg Center uh, project. So. What was very different from the San Francisco job to the Bloomberg Center job was the requirement for the Bloomberg Center project to create its own energy. It wasn't enough just to consume little energy. We actually had to create energy on site. Currently, all the only available technology that we have to, to, to be able to do that is photovoltaic uh, or solar panels. So if you kind of think about the requirements to use uh, photovoltaic panels for a building, especially for a tech building where everybody is on computer and it's very sort of electrical demand, electrical load driven, uh, there's just a lot of real estate that you need for photovoltaic. It's easy to do that in Spain. That's, a, uh, I think, one of the largest, if not the largest array of solar panels. Uh, open field, mm, easy to do. Um, it's a little bit tougher to do in an urban setting right? Because you need to go flat. You can't go up just because you need that area. So uh, what kind of drove us to think about the project as a, form, as a form factor requirement is we need surface. It was a game about increasing square footage as much as we can uh, for the solar panels. And at the same time, being able to integrate that very array, that very sort of horizontal surface within the architecture 
and the urban planning of the project. So uh, the the initial the initial request from Cornell was, and you, you're seeing a picture now with the overall uh, campus. I think you see them. Do you see my mouse? Okay, cool. Uh, the first phase of our project is at the north end of the 12 acre site. The original request from Cornell was just to put the PV panels uh, everywhere where you see green. And we thought that was crazy uh, because uh, as a campus that's there that participates in the public life of Roosevelt Island, uh, and it's sort of an entry space into the Four Freedoms Park uh, to use up some of the best open spaces in the entire Manhattan and Queens area to photo photovoltaic panels is just kind of insane, uh, right? So immediately we sort of started uh, debating that. And we said that's a, that's a non-starter for us. And what we need to do is we need to optimize that plan and we need to integrate PVs to be on top of buildings and liberate the ground floor to do other things, uh, such as giving it back to the sort of public life of the campus, right? As a, as a very sort of important concept and driver. So um, it sort of initiated that as, uh, as that piece of integration and this is the first uh, sort of massing that was given to us by the by the master plan. SOM did the master plan, and uh, to their credit, they started with a master plan with no idea of what any of these buildings even represented. They just had a few sort of relationship between the buildings. Uh, so we were essentially kind of working with SOM and kind of starting from scratch because now we actually had a program. We had sort of demand-driven performance requirements, and from here what we were really suggesting is they're not sort of uh, vertical boxes, but in fact, uh, it's more of a, of a canopy uh, idea. And we, we call this uh, a, a lily pad, right? And we were really thinking about this sort of surface where it was sort of an energy collecting device. So you begin to see these kind of very small kind of study models and, uh, and built and it just, below the canopy, buildings just happened. Because we weren't interested in the buildings as much as we were interested in the canopy piece. And we thought the canopy piece was fairly critical to the overall campus because we thought that uh, through the edge of this canopy, it could actually begin to define a new type of urban space where you're kind of walking in, it, everything is open underneath it, but at the same time, you have a sense of a campus because you're underneath a feature that goes sort of everywhere, you know. So this is probably the model and the images done very, very early on as part of the initial kind of conversation and discussion. Um, the building to the right is actually our building, what we call the first academic building. The building on the left of this rendering is a developer building. At that time, they didn't have uh, a developer assigned to it. They, they had no idea, is it even gonna be built? We don't know the timing and what have you. So we presented it to Cornell. Uh, they, really, they really liked and they were kind of very uh, interested in the, in the concept, but they said, well, you're crazy, uh, you're insane. Uh, because if you build this canopy, uh, no one will be able to build any buildings underneath it because you're trying to erect a building and there's a cap on top of what you're trying to do. So from a cost and constructability point of view, it ain't gonna work. So we were, uh, we were pretty bummed out about that. So I think this is one of the pieces where we sort of failed uh, at, the, at the start. And what required us to do is we had to now dislocate the PV canopy from buildings because we knew that was a non-starter. Uh, because of the economic pressures, the schedule pressures, and what have you. So ultimately, taking a very long story, uh, longer maybe, uh, the section became more like this. So the section that you see to the right is the Bloomberg Center, uh, the first academic building. The building to the left was is a developer building. Eventually, Wise Manfredi uh, designed this building. Uh, for then for a city Radnor, and they did an amazing job doing it. Uh, but you can kind of see what happened, right? The developer building uh, 
the, both buildings were conceptualized to be the same height initially, but developers being developers, they added another floor to the building. So the two buildings then sectionally got dislocated and what the PV canopy was supposed to do, which was to create a sort of data line, also got slightly dislocated, all right? So that was a slight break in the sort of urban concept uh, for us. Uh, nevertheless, uh, now that we were focused on the canopy and building only to our first academic building, what we wanted to strive for uh, was a canopy that still became independent of our building to still try to keep some notion that the derivative and the edge of the building wasn't done through the footprint of the building itself, but that there was a higher device above you that talked about a new defined edge around the campus and around the building. Uh, it was as much of a narrative, it's also quite functional because we needed the solar panel uh, to be as big as we could. The bigger it was, the more PV panels we can fit. It's just a game of real estate. Uh, and the bigger the canopy, the more shading we could actually shade the building underneath us. So the canopy functioned not only as a solar panel energy collecting device, but it was actually a, me a, a mega shade for the building. Right, that kind of decreased the cooling load uh, quite a bit. Um, I don't, I'm not gonna go, I, th th probably there's a lot of technicalities about PV panels. Uh, you know, PV panels usually, uh, you think that they want to face uh, south, right? Because it's south, we're in Northern hemisphere. Uh, if you point PV south, then you get more, uh, you can collect through more hours of the day. But in New York, that's actually not the right equation. In New York, the name of the game is actually to collect the most energy from the sun during the peak times of energy consumption, which is around four to six, right? So if you imagine four to six, it's when everybody's still at the office and people are coming home. So there's sort of this kind of dual consumption. And that is when the demand in New York is the highest. So if there's ever kind of like a blackout, it happens around that time because of the load at that. And that's when energy prices are the highest. So New York City is a very sort of odd place because the economic driver is not about maximizing PVs. It's actually maximizing PVs at the time of highest consumption, which is not facing south, right? So we kind of learned that uh, because that had some kind of technical consequence the PVs were uh, designed and phased. So that was a bit of an interesting piece. Uh, and then as you go through the edge, the canopy always sort of expresses itself. And what, as architects, we really love this because uh, it's a building that is net zero and often net zero is so sort of uh, uh, equated with, you know, kind of boxy stuff, hyper efficient kind of stuff but we like the canopy because it provided for some level of looseness. Uh, it's a little bit uh, more lyrical than just like a square box, right? So we really kind of like the identity of that. Uh, and then looking, uh, this is kind of looking south, the ribbon at the bottom is peeled off because there's an outside terrace over here. And that's also giving some shading to the seats just outside of the cafe. Uh, this is along sort of the midpoint of the building. Again, it's, you, you always see the PV from every kind of surface because it sort of expresses itself really kind of out, outwardly from the building. And then this is facing the inner portion of the campus. This is right at sort of the main entrance. The main entrance is under the sort of Bloomberg sign right uh, there. And then to the left, there is uh, what we call sort of a monumental stair that looks down at a garden on the second floor and the PV uh, canopy at this side is actually being picked up by the structure of that stair. So it's a stair that keeps sort of going and then it sort of acts as a column and pillar to pick up that edge uh, of the canopy. Uh, on the inside, we always wanted to kind of correlate and give you visually the connection uh, of the PVs as well. So this is now you're inside that little stair moment looking down at the terrace. And then if you're kind of just coming out of that stairs, there's a movement piece. And on the very top, there's an open light well. And from there, you also see the uh, PV panels because we always wanted to give you uh, moments of connections to that piece of canopy. 
And then there, you, you're sort of now coming out of that stereotype and looking into Manhattan. You're now looking this sort of other way through this kind of atrium piece. Um, so uh, I think that's uh, a lot of the parts that sort of related to the expression of the very top of the building. This is kind of a, a slight fly through here. So again, that's stair five. You're seeing the stair five there on your forefront. The view from the river. So this and this last piece of this uh, clip here is a nice one because it takes me to the second subject uh, of this, which is about surface and and the facade. And um, I, you know, I have to say that probably as an architect, uh, one of the coolest things and some of the things that still makes me wake up at night like a little kid is that I get to work with people who are very um, interesting. Uh, who are either doing some kind of research that's really kind of related to our interests as architects. And these people are coming from all kinds of crazy, interesting backgrounds, both culturally and uh, as, as pieces of their own kind of research. So uh, I put this image in because uh, this, this was quite co coincidental. And this was really, really fun. And this was a, a kind of a direct connection between architects and uh, these kind of like hardcore tech guys, right? Uh, one of the research by um, by one of the uh, PhDs was uh, about uh, image recognition. Uh, so image recognition these days, as you guys all know, is kind of like the application of it is kind of like everywhere. And uh, he was looking at image recognition, you know, in the case on the uh, images on the left, like objects, uh, then scenes, and then objects in scenes. And what he would simply do is uh, they would harvest the world wide web for like faces. And what he did is he just superimposed faces, like millions of faces, images of faces on top of faces. And what he did is he gave you like an average face that looked like no one's face, but everyone's faces. And he would do that constantly then for pedestrians, for cars, for cows and hand and chair. And what happened was it took a, a very specific item and completely generalized it. And he sort of created a ghost image that now his piece of software, when he saw this ghost and this average could then go to a specific uh, result, which is this is a chair, right? So he did that then for different scenes, for different objects and scenes. And then he created these kind of what they look like clouds, right? Because they're really like many images on top of each other. So that was the kind of stuff that we we learned and we were talking about and we were fully connected to them. Uh, the coincidental part is that we as architects were also very interested in that dynamicism in the sense of how do you make a building uh, that is sort of uh, transformative or it sort of moves or it feels like a cloud, right? It's kind of like undefined. Architects, are we, we deal with like brick and mortars. Right. So when you think about a building um, that changes, yes, conceptually, that's fine. But when you actually think about how do you actually do that, it's kind of tricky. Right. Maybe uh, Liz Diller did that many years ago with the cloud building. Right. Spraying like water everywhere. And it's just, just a cloud. And so there's movement and it changes. So uh, we, we were interested in the sense that we were going we had a perspective of the architect and the builder, which is how do you create something that's very specific to us into a building surface that allows you for that ambiguity, for that slightly transformative figure that every time you go there, it sort of changes a little bit, right? So uh, we were trying to do that via this kind of process of pixelation. So we took these metal panels and we sort of cut them uh, and what you're left off is like these little coins and it allowed us to kind of move around them, right? Because now we're actually talking about simple act of hinging something that's kind of like a cutout. And in a very simple way, we threw light there and we kind of looked at a condition and you look sort of both uh, ambiguous, pretty, 
it, it sort of created the sort of dynamicism that we were very influenced uh, with. So, uh, th and this is now kind of, get, this gets into a little bit of the shop talk of how we got through that sort of very uh, process of dynamicism, but, but how we got there. Uh, these things on the left are meant to represent each one of these pixelations. So we had sort of like two moves that we could do them. We would cut them and then we could uh, what we called uh, rock them. Like we could change the angle, right? Which is what we're trying to imply through this diagram on the left. And depending on the angle, of course, the light would hit in a slightly different way. That's one function, that's one variable. The second variable is in plan, if you just rotate the axis of the pixel, so you're just kind of rotating that little circular thing. And then we call that the row, the row. So we kind of came up with this nomenclature, which is you can rock and roll, right? So it's like one or the other kind of function. So we then tested that. And uh, we worked with a company out of Kansas City called uh, Zaner. Um, it's, uh, they do a lot of very fancy buildings. Uh, very fancy skins. They have uh, kind of an amazing amount of uh, automation and sophistication, but more importantly, they're also like uh, share a deep interest in design. So we worked with, uh, with Zayner uh, and, and Anthony Bickler and, uh, and Paul Martin. Uh, so these were a few tests of that sort of rock and roll. So uh, for example, on this one, you can see that the hinging is all the same and we're just playing with the angle, right? And that sort of gives you a certain kind of sensibility to the panel. Uh, this is a version is if all the angles are the same and we're just rotating the axis of this thing, right? It gives you a slightly different quality uh, on the panel and the light catches it just slightly the different way. And this is a full kind of, if you go crazy, this is a, what we call the rock and roll. We're, we're now changing the angle and at the same time, we're hinging this uh, in, in the different axis as you move through it. So we sort of understood the two variables, the pixelation, and uh, what we then worked with, and this is two guys uh, in our office. I think one of them was a Cornell kid and one was an MIT kid, and they kind of worked together on just re really creating a simple grasshopper command because we could now connect any image, which is the stuff that you see on top, and then we could run the grasshopper command. So the one on the left is just the rock, the one on the right is the rock and roll. So now we were able to, uh, to uh, create a baseline image to create an equivalency on the panelization. And uh, we then sort of kind of digitally tested it under different angles and different light conditions because before they build this whole thing, uh, we wanted to get a general sensibility and we wanted to kind of understand how this thing kind of actually looked like and how it sort of reacted. Uh, so there you see sort of the panels. We kind of, we were there, this is in Kansas City. We kind of looked at it from a couple different hours of the day. So this is one, this is a slightly different angle. And it was pretty amazing for us because at one time you see the panels on the top, they look very bronzy and they were kind of very sort of flat. But then as soon as you kind of walked over a couple of steps, it took an entire different kind of vibrancy to it. You know, So again, we were really interested in sort of this dynamicism uh, and the fact that every time you go there, it, it looks um, slightly different or the reading of it is slightly different. So that got us really excited. So we were like, oh man, we got it, let's do it. Uh, now, how are we going to do it? Because we got a lot of panels. Uh, so uh, one of the Zener engineers uh, noticed that they had a very old welding robot arm decommissioned, very sad, sitting in the corner of their warehouse, which is sort of this yellow kind of piece. And he sort of took that out uh, literally from storage. Uh, he printed a 3D nose that was adaptable to the head. He took the welding, the, the electronic machine out of the welder, and he just put this kind of new nozzle, and he programmed the arm to be able to register the pixelation and where this thing needs to go through to be able to hinge each one of these tabs, right? So... Um, 
couple of tests, a uh, couple of trials, a couple of errors, uh, and then uh, one sort of happy day, uh, it, it sort of worked. Uh, and this is a video uh, of that one sort of test on a full panel. This is a little bit like uh, hypnotizing. It's, it starts very slow, but you're going to see it move a little bit quicker. And this is a rock and roll. So it, it needs to know the subtlety of where actually the hinge point is, you know, because it's sort of got to go, it has to go to that location. So I don't know why, it's, I feel it's soothing watching this thing, just kind of um, slowly walk through the millions or whatever hundreds of thousands of these little tabs that this thing had to go through painstakingly. You know, so uh, after this, we got, we got pretty excited because we, we now had the entire vertical connection from the image that we want to use the pixelation, the grasshopper command, and now we actually had a tool uh, to be able to do this with. Um, so uh, the name of the game after this function was scale, right? Now we're talking about many, many panels, many, many tabs, because we're talking about having an entire building wrapped around this thing. And we were always joking that if this poor old welding arm goes kibbutz, we are really kibbutz. Uh, so basically the thing ran 24-7. Uh, it performed incredibly. Uh, you're now seeing the first unitized pieces of the facade that were fully sort of rocked and rolled. A lot of sort of visual inspections with the contractor before it came out of the factory. This is, by the way, a company called Island Fabrication out of Long Island. Uh, even sort of the storing and the crating of these panels were uh, kind of logistically coordinated. These things take a lot of room on site, so we have to be very careful kind of managing that process. And in parallel, while the robot was doing its thing, uh, we were, uh, our team were all looking at the actual other technical components of the, the glazing, the silicone joining, the weeps, and everything that's sort of related to the overall unitized building, right? As well as looking at the robot arm doing its thing. So this is an image of one of the performance uh, mock-ups uh, that we sort of flushed out. Uh, I think if there is one big takeaway of this process that I showed you, is when people look at the facade in its entirety, people are always uh, commenting, wow, this is like, it's like AI, you know, like super high technology, very digital. And I, my counterpoint is that it's actually not. Uh, it took a few people uh, time to kind of develop the grasshopper. Uh, it was an old machine that basically wasn't really doing anything. Uh, that actually created all these things. Uh, in fact, if you probably look around your studio, you literally have the tools to do this. I think you do. And all you really need is um, some sort of foresight and some sort of planning to be able to do this. And it's not like advanced technology at all, right? It's more, it's, it's, less, it's less technology and it's more like manufacturing that you have to figure out and logistics, right? So uh, it's, it's it, it, I'd say the biggest challenge after we went through the front end part to just kind of figure out how to do one panel was scalability. We just needed to do more, faster and that kind of thing. And that became the sort of constricting critical point uh, of our production method, right? So again, we kind of loved seeing all these things under different daylight conditions. What you see on the left was what we call the architects call this the VMU. This is the visual mockup. It's just like little pieces just put together to kind of flush out things. And the big brother to the right is what we call the performance mockup. This is like the facade, like it's really built. And they throw water at it. They look at any kind of thermal bridging. 
uh, they uh, seal the thing and they throw air at it to see if there's any air infiltration. So when you go out there and you hear people talking about VMU and PMU, those are the two words that we use as a visual mock-up versus a performance mock-up. Okay. Uh, I think one, uh, one of the funny things was uh, we had to go through the uh, Building Commission of New York and they were constantly asking, um, you know, that as a part of a standard package, you have to submit uh, like elevations to, to them for them to, to approve. And we were saying, well, it's kind of hard. Like, how do you even render this kind of stuff, right? And they were like, no, no, but we need a rendering. We need to see what it looks like. So we went like constantly back and forth trying to give them images that could give you a sensibility of this thing and what it looked like because it kind of changes over the daylight. So we submitted what we called a series of like almost heat maps. So we codify the rock and rolling with a color. So it was a little easier for them to kind of even understand the concept. So these are just a few of those images that we sort of put together for the city to kind of understand maybe one kind of quality of what it ultimately sort of looks like. And then uh, the image, the mega image that we used to produce and author that entire surface, uh, we split the building in roughly two halves. One half views Manhattan and the other side of the building faces the inner campus. So this, the view that faces Manhattan, we use an, the actual elevation of Manhattan itself. It's like the, the, as, as if you're looking at the Manhattan view, but it's projected on the surface of the building. And then we did this sort of kind of performance of the rock and roll. The side that faces uh, the inner campus, we used an image of one of the Ithaca gorges because Ithaca is gorgeous. So we sort of imprinted that on the inner portion uh, as you walk through. So a few images of what the final result kind of looked like. This is at the southern end of the building. A few more close-ups. Again, it's it's really like if you ever get a chance to to take a look, uh, it's it's really cool because if you're there in the morning or if you're there uh, slightly during the winter days when the sun is down a little bit, you get a slightly different you know shadow variability to the thing. Um, I you know I my impression always uh, that I get is that it's a building that you have to come very close. You know, and the closer you get, the more intricate it becomes. Because uh, if you look from a top, it just looks like something. But as you get closer, you begin to kind of see these slight uh, areas of intensity of light and less intensity of light. We have some areas inside the building where we're able to kind of create a transparency. So you see the sort of net effect of that daylight coming in. And then there's a play of actually solid uh, metal pieces versus the one that actually has a sort of rock and roll tilt uh, to it. This is probably one of the areas where you come closest to the panel, which is the second floor terrace. And then uh, the image, uh, the, the, fin the actual paint, uh, it's an it's aluminum panel. And the actual paint is a PPG. Uh, it's a company manufacturer. It's a PPG product, and the paint itself is also iridescent. You know, it's 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 it, the paint itself is uh, is color shifting, so that even adds another kind of variable to the reading of this thing as well. And I think this may be the last image related to this. Yeah, I, uh, Tom, I I know that you wanted to go through the Bloomberg Center and then uh, kind of kick off a, a different kind of discussion, maybe either related to the building or other things. I just slipped a few things uh, here that is a little bit more personal to me, just to uh, maybe get some themes uh, flushed out. Um, sure, that would be great, uh, thank you. I, cool. Uh, I'm, I'm much older, obviously, than, than all of you guys, all of the, at least the students, Tom. Uh, I was, um, I, I was in grad school like you guys. Uh, I graduated in 1996. Um, and uh, one of the things that I was really kind of interested in were drawings at that time. And, you know, uh, going back to, to that time, uh, there were a couple of seminal pieces of different architects doing work on drawings. Uh, this is Tom Main's uh, Sixth Street House, uh, Andrew Zago. Um, who now teaches at SciArc uh, and worked on a lot of these drawings. Uh, 
And these are really, you know, this is a little bit before computer, but they were trying to like uh, imitate the functions of a computer in the sense that you can see different projections at the same time, you know, uh, a plan to a section, to an axon, to a perspective. We were, I was also very mesmerized by um, uh, Lips, Daniel Lipskin did a whole series of drawings called Chamber Works. He was dealing like with music and things like that, which was like just beautiful drawings. Uh, Zaha was doing her own drawings with the, um, uh, with the fire station, which was also kind of really kind of beautiful. But it, it affected uh, to me in the sense that there were uh, just beautiful things and beautiful images. And he kind of left architecture a little bit more open-ended, uh, which I think is what kind of really triggered my curiosity to both architecture and, and these drawings. It's what sort of made me gravitate towards the drawings. Uh, the fact that there were like multiple readings to these things, you know, which I really kind of liked. And to me, as I look back in architecture school, it's, it's, it's about, uh, it's, a, it's as much about learning uh, the technical side of architecture, because again, we, we are builders, right? We deal with ground plane, we deal with section and elevations, but uh, it's also a time where you have to sort of push your creative boundaries a bit, you know, and you always get stuck. You're working on a project and you get stuck and you feel like it's a finite uh, creative process. And to me, when I looked at these drawings, it sort of made me realize that it, there is never an end it's a, just a pursuit. And that one thing is only as good to take you to the next thing, right? So that's how I kind of like to think about architecture. No project that I work on or no project that we talk about is like it. There is always sort of a next step for the process and it's a continuous process. So when I think about everything that I've worked on since even grad school, to me, it's just the continuous exploration of work and it's it's very it's very difficult sometimes to find that sort of next steps, but that's also what makes it really kind of cool and interesting. And it's a different thing that architects do, unlike let's say lawyers or you know doctors and what have you. They live in a finite world, and to me, uh, what makes me really thrive and really interested in architecture is that we don't deal with exactly in those terms, right? So th those are things that really kind of made me think uh, a lot. Uh, and to this day, you know, uh, we're, we're still making those drawings. And the drawings have now become more like three-dimensional drawings because we have 3D printers and things like that. So we're kind of continuing that exploration. We're building on buildings, but we all, it's important for us to flush out things like this, uh, which is more instinctual and, uh, and really sort of pushes kind of like a creative uh, aspect of our thinking process. Uh, so that's that's one piece. The other piece uh, that I always f find like incredible too uh, is you know forget like the digital stuff, forget that. Um, to this day, I look at things that were built in this case in the sixth century, and I look at this and I think like how the hell did they do that? Like how, right? And why? But who could do? And this is like, we're talking about sixth century and you like everything about this image, it makes me stay up at night thinking about it, all right? And to me, again, that's like architecture and nothing to me evokes that level of curiosity, right? Like this is like carved into a stone mountain and they carved not at the top where you have less weight, they carved at the bottom, right? And like the details and the column and the modularity, like this is to me as modern as you can get modern today. And it's in terms of its design, technology, surface, composition, detailing, you name it. And this rivals kind of like anything that we did today. So architecture to me is really, it's cheesy to say, but it's like totally timeless. And it's evocative, it's provocative, it's beautiful, it's scary, it's mysterious, and it's never ending. So the one thing that I want to maybe share with you guys in this kind of year of the pandemic is don't lose faith. You guys are doing and working in a profession 
that has untapped possibility historically, technologically, conceptually, storytelling. We we really do have a very significant uh, seat on the table as far as building and affecting cities, affecting streetscapes, affecting program people. There's a lot of discourse these days about environment, sustainability, health, absolutely. Uh, to take things down versus preserving it. So I think you guys are entering in an incredible moment in architecture history. And although sometimes it may look like uh, it's a moment of despair, I actually would tell you guys, you should shift that upside down. There's never been more potential ever than now for you guys to really kind of play an incredible influence to that built environment. So, Tom, I think that's that's my piece here, and then I'll open it up back to you. Well, thank you so much. That's uh, what a what a great way to end. I'm I'm so glad you added your personal uh, reflections uh, in a more general sense, uh, uh, and really just wonderful to hear um, you know your your narrative of your experience of of. Uh, uh, bringing the project, the Bloomberg Center, from uh, its its concepts, its challenges to um, its completion, and there's so many things that that you've you've shared, which uh, really are not visible uh, uh, from from experiencing the building. Um, of the six buildings we're looking at, this is probably the one I I spend uh, a lot of time at. I live in Roosevelt Island, uh, and um, I knew of the building before I moved here, and. Um, you know, like most architects, we, 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 we approach buildings um, as we see them for the first time. And I was really, um, I was really blown away by the, the, the nuance and subtlety of it. And there was so much that I really didn't understand what was going on, uh, why it really, you know, the canopy um, in particular, um, the various kinds of functionalities of it, like seemed to, to have a, a story that I just didn't uh, know right away. Uh, and over time, I've appreciated very much the, the kinds of ambiguities that you talk about um, of the appearance from different points of views and, and different uh, lighting conditions, times of day, uh, and the way that the building has um, so many different kinds of nuanced um, affects and, and appearances. Uh, I'm, I'm rather, I, I, I could go on and, and talk about the building. <laughs> Uh, and and, and uh, congratulate you more for what a great piece uh, and contribution. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll introduce our, our two students who will um, ask a few questions as an informal interview, uh, Tami Noah and Yuti Kotari. Uh, this has really been part of the, the format of uh, short presentations followed by an informal interview. So uh, over to yourselves, uh, Tami and Yuti. Hello. My name is Yuti. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for taking out time of your schedule and joining us here today. And we are grateful for all your efforts that you took to share your journey and experience with us. That was a very enlightening presentation. Thank you so much. So I shall begin the interview with some contextual questions that we have. Um, so the Bloomberg Center represents a unique opportunity to investigate the intersection of three territories, as we understand. Firstly, the unique urban condition of Roosevelt Island, which has a legacy of architectural excellence from Johnson and Rudolph's master plan. So it's buildings and Louis Kahn's Four Freedom Park. Secondly, the Bloomberg Center and the Cornell Tech participate as an academic hub within the clustering of top universities in the city in New York City. And thirdly, the Bloomberg Center is a beacon of environmental performance. We would like to ask some questions about this particular agenda of the building. While the environmental concerns of the Bloomberg Center, along with its various environmental systems, have made a bold political statement on environmental responsibility, the risks of flooding by the uh, rising sea level seems to be a paramount concern of the project. As the site sits on an island within uh, the East River, can you share with us how had the design scheme been impacted by the flooding of Roosevelt Island during the Hurricane Sandy? And what are the specific impacts of climate change uh, had been considered during the design process? Yeah, uh, I, I would say the, the three items that you pointed out, 
where you started off the question, uh, which is about sort of the uh, the the academic program, the urbanity of Rosett Island. It, 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 to us, um, and, and every project is about uh, multiple agendas, requirements, performance. So uh, there, these buildings, uh, nothing that we do exists um, in silos. In other words, it really is about the integration of the urban planning, the urban condition, Roosevelt Island, with an academic campus program, with a high performance net zero building. And there's not enough, um, there's literally not enough money to do uh, three different things. You have to do one thing that does all three things together because you have to be very efficient in that sense. So, uh, when we had to deal with Hurricane Sandy, the way that we had to deal with that is the same way as you think about the identity of the building. And it's connected to campus planning and it's connected to energy. So it's, it's very holistic in that sense. You can't separate the building uh, in its objectives uh, in sort of different buckets because it all exists in the same bucket. Uh, when we were working on the project, we were, to this day, I'll always remember it. We were in the middle of schematic design, uh, actually uh, towards the tail end of schematic design. And uh, our, our world, especially as I think uh, Northeasterners, especially New Yorkers changed because Hurricane Sandy hit us, right? And, um, if you guys were around, there's a few moments that I can, you know, I've been here for a couple of years now. You know, I went through the big blackouts. This is a couple of years ago. I went through 9-11 uh, and I went to Hurricane Sandy, right? So all those three things were uh, incredibly uh, strange moments, uh, sad moments. Um, and we had a very slightly different scheme before Hurricane Sandy came. In other words, uh, we had a building that was lower. We had our, you know, architects like to think like Corbusian, right? Like the, the roof plan is the fifth facade. So we had a, 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 we had a roof plan that was very clean. We had like no mechanical anything. Like everything was occupiable because at that time, everything was in the basement in terms of its mechanical system. So. After Hurricane Sandy came, of course, that was no longer the plan. We couldn't bury uh, anything uh, below uh, ground level. So everything got moved up to the very rooftop. What it meant is we actually had to bring everything from the street and we had to bring all the services and pump it up the building, right? Which is kind of like a big deal uh, mechanically, but we had no choice. Uh, the few things that we had on the ground floor that we still have had to stay there. We, I didn't go into this, but the building uses, um, the, it uses a geothermal well system. So in other words, it's collecting all the stable, approximately 50 degree cold water from the earth, and then we use it into the building. Uh, and we have a few pieces of equipment on the basement because it's got to be there because it's tied to the geothermal well. So what we did is all of those pieces of equipment, uh, we specified and designed them to be the submergible type. So we can flood the basement, but these units are meant to be like a submarine. They have an enclosed chassis so they can perform underwater. And we also elevated every piece of machine in the mechanical room as high as we could. So you could put two feet of water in our mechanical basement and everything is kind of elevated. And the last thing that we had to do is anything that's coming from the street that has penetration on the wall of the basement, we moved everything as high as we could on the wall. We didn't want any penetration low, of course, because that's where the compromise point is. So everything got elevated. So. You know, some people say that, wow, you, you like thought through it. I call it, it's common sense in this world of, of you know, uh, of, of, of sandy rising tides and what have you. So there was a lot of close work with our mechanical engineers, which was Arup, uh, very close work with Cornell Tech because they're also looking from a facilities management point of view. Uh, so 
you know, going through uh, that sort of big move, which is taking all the mechanical and putting it up because that's the safest place to safeguard it. And then doing what we can to uh, have anything on the basement level that's mechanical still be able to work when it's underwater is what we had to do after uh, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so like as our professor um, shared with you in the beginning, in this uh, seminar, we are looking at a series of six projects uh, that will be analyzed along the set of themes. And this week's theme is climate and energy with the case study of Bloomberg Center. We believe the project to be a bold statement on sustainability as the building aims to attain uh, net zero energy. So we uh, understand that uh, there is a spotlight on the uh, lily pad canopy of EVs, other green features such as geothermal wells and a rainwater collection system for all electricity buildings. Uh, but uh, how successful uh, has the building been to achieve the net zero building status? Could you please describe the performance of the rain screen wall system, which is the outermost layer of the facade composed of aluminum panels? And how does the system balance the exterior views and daylight and maximizes insulation and minimizes thermal bridging in the building? Um, yeah, so I, I don't have the metrics. I don't have the, uh, their energy bill to see what their consumption is looking like. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to get a little bit of that post-occupancy metric uh, done to see how the building is behaving. Uh, the building is also not fully loaded yet. Uh, in other words, Cornell Tech is, is still scaling up. So we designed the building to, I think, have an ultimate uh, campus of, I think, like 2,000 people, if I'm recalling this correctly. Uh, and Cornell Tech is not full yet. So in fact, uh, it, it was easier for us to achieve net zero in the beginning because there's only like 50% of students are enrolled, right? So they're matriculating more people over the years. So the energy consumption will go up higher and then we're gonna see how everything that we did is measuring against that. So that's sort of the first, uh, I think, response to your question. Uh, I think the second piece is uh, as far as the sustainability and the uh, building envelope, uh, we had a rule that we had to only have, you know, you see all these glass buildings. Um, they're great. Uh, you have views, but they're probably not the best facade from a insulation property point of view that you can get. So our rule was 60-40. What that means is that 40% of the facade is glass and only 40% and 60% has to be well insulated solid facade. Okay. So basically what he meant is we, we wouldn't have an all glass building. Uh, we had to be, because we only had 40% of the surface to be glass, we had to be very cognizant of where we put glass. Right. So the rule for us is that all the public spaces, uh, the areas of the cafe at the ground floor uh, was fully glazed because we want and need that transparency. Areas of the atrium where people are moving, we put transparency there. And then the areas where we actually have work uh, settings, studio-like loft spaces, we actually had to optimize the glazing quite a bit to maximize daylight, but at the same time, not make it all glass. Yeah. Uh, if you ever get a chance or someday when we get a chance to walk through the building uh, interior, it actually feels very, very well lit. You don't get the sense that this is like a net zero and it's like dark. It's actually quite the opposite, quite the opposite. Because we were able to really locate them, uh, the glazing in the right spots, it actually feels very well open, uh, quote unquote. Uh, I think the last answer to your part of your question is in the areas where we had uh, opaque walls, so the other 60%, um, what we did is we put the insulation outboard from the interior framing. In other words, typically you have like studs, right? You have your framing and insulation goes inside that cavity. And what you have is a little bit of a thermal bridge because your frame is exposed. In the case of Bloomberg Center, 
we had a frame and then we put the insulation outboard. So uh, my analogy is truly that we put a jacket over the entire building without having thermal bridging through these frame members, which is always like a thing, you know? So the answer, the short answer is we were able to achieve continuity of insulation around the perimeter, uh, which really kind of worked um, and allow us to detail the sort of best skin from a performance point of view. There is a con, there is a disadvantage to doing that. Uh, the disadvantage is that your facade thickness grows because typically you have your stud and because you have insulation, you can get you know everything in, call it like eight inches or 12 inches. Because we're putting insulation outboard, your wall thickness increases. What that means is you have less space inside, right? In our case, we're working with a university. If you're working for, let's say, a developer, it's a really big deal because they are really kind of counting every sort of inch, quote unquote. Uh, so there is a bit of a, it's, 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 it's a bit discouraged to be able to do that kind of nice insulated wall if you're working on a project that really is trying to push the usable area inside the, in the, inside the space. Thank you. Thank you once again. <clears throat> um, my colleague sure. will continue with the further questions of the interview. Over to Hi. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Tammy Nong. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for your time and giving us a wonderful presentation, which already covered uh, most of our question through your presentation. Um, actually, I was, my first question will be, I was going to ask, um, if you could share with us the journey and process of these facades coming to life, uh, the D6 cut out from the metal panels on fours on the facade, which are tilted and which you um, put it rock and roll process, uh, tilted in a different uh, directions on uniquely and catches the sunlight in interesting ways. And this makes the building looks like um, it's changing colors from green to brown to gold. Um, so um, in further to your uh, presentation, can you explain how the facade took inspiration from the waterfall um, in Itaka and the Manhattan skyline to illustrate the connection between the two campuses? And um, in the design process, was it intended having the different colors on facade, facade that um, vary over time during the day? Um, I remember you mentioned the special paint which called P PPG, was it intended? And lastly, uh, and will the facade panels be patinated eventually over the long period of, of, period of time? Was my question. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, yeah, so uh, I'll start with the last piece of your question, which is no, this, this product, uh, this paint is uh, inert, so it won't change color, so it won't patinate. Yeah, so you'd say how it is uh, today. Um, in, I think uh, one of the images that I showed uh, in the PowerPoint presentation um, talked about the two sides of the building and what we use as the source image. Uh, the one that's facing Manhattan is little, we, we had a, a photographer come in and take a picture of New York. And then we use that uh, to generate the, the patterning uh, on this side facing New York. The one that faces the inner campus, we did an equivalent uh, image, but the Ithaca uh, Gorge. And uh, again, if you had the image, the photograph next to you, and you're sitting in front of the building, uh, you could probably kind of see, you can create that relationship, but you wouldn't be able to see it like literally. You know, it's not like the image uh, translate literally because we the, the only relationship is this kind of rocking and rolling, you know? So although we're using an image, by the time we're actually done, you, you won't be able to translate it one-to-one, uh, -one, but you're going to see that there is a pattern. If you look at the photograph, the bright spots will register with certain kind of moves of the facade because of the bright spot. So there's a little bit of a relationship. Um, I, in terms of the iridescent color, which I think you mentioned, it, it is green. Sometimes it looks bronzy. Um, 
we we actually had a really difficult time uh, getting that approved uh, by both Cornell and the city. And uh, a lot of the comments were that it was too dark um, or how does it look within the, the context because that's what really uh, people kind of care about, the materiality, the texture, and the color. And again, it was very difficult to, to kind of talk about what it's going to look like because the color shifts. Sometimes it's green, sometimes it's bronze. But what we ended up uh, really speaking about is that uh, the bronze is really correlates closely with the Queensboro Bridge. Like there's a bronziness to that infrastructure piece. And what we look, what we liked about the bronze in our building is that this building is not architecture, it's infrastructure for people to do work in. It's an infrastructure to collect energy. It's an infrastructure to be able to do certain things that allows the school to, to, to operate, just like the bridge is a piece of infrastructure. It allows you, and we liked the kind of connection of the bronziness to that, to that picture, you know? The green was really uh, nice because I don't think anyone could sort of predict what it would look like at the scale of the building, but when you see the green, there's a certain tonality to like even the streetscape in Roosevelt Island, the landscape, and even uh, like the water, you know? Uh, there is a little it, sometimes the water has a little sort of bluish green tint. So we like the green because it kind of really, um, again, it sort of connected you to that sort of specific color of the of the context of Roosevelt Island, you know. And again, that was like a really difficult process to, to approve that. People wanted uh, like brighter. They, we want brighter colors. This looks a little it looks very dark, you know, uh, but through those mock ups the visual mock-ups, we were able to kind of prove it out that it's actually way more dynamic, way more lively, and way more enriching than just looking at a piece of paint in front of you because this thing behaves in a very particular uh, way. Thank you. Um, our next question will be regarding the other project Morphosis had. Uh, what is the relation of the Bloomberg Center to all your project and Morphosis architect? It is similar to other past projects. Um, I yes, I mean, as as a person who works in the office, uh, you know, we really strive to think that um, every project or every client needs something that's very specific to their needs, you know. And in that sense, no project uh, can look alike because every client is different. You know, so we like to think that our projects are different than the projects that we're working on currently. Um, and we're working on a few things that are kind of at an urban level and a few things here now that we're working on that's almost like product design um, that we like to think that those are quite different. Uh, however, I do say that for every office, there is a shared uh, like DNA right, for every project, because there's a, uh, there's a particular process to us. Uh, there's a particular way to uh, engage and ask questions about a project that it's kind of a little bit similar uh, across the board. Uh, so, you know, uh, I guess to answer your question, I don't think every project uh, can look alike. However, they do share uh, a, a a connection in in sort of the fundamental in the DNA because we have a uh, uh, a process of asking certain kinds of questions to get us going into the project. Thank you. Um, oh, in in addition to your answer, but I was gonna um, ask further uh, if has the Bloomberg Center influ influenced the other project by Morphosis worked on in this in the office alongside this project parallelly and those which had come come on board after its completion because the Bloomberg Center is kind of a, like a wonderful project uh, as the icon so I, I just wanted to ask if you have any other project coming on like in, in front, influenced by this project yeah, I, I, I think so. Uh, yes. Uh, and I think every project influences the next project. You know, I think, uh, 
I think like you guys, I like to think that every project that I work on, that we work on, will be better than the next project, right? Because you're always kind of advancing. Um, uh, you know, I would say uh, that the particulars of that to Bloomberg Center is, um, you know, and I'm gonna use like other peers to kind of think about this uh, and to make an analogy. I have very deep respect for offices, let's say like Foster, right? Uh, because you begin to realize that in order for you to create certain, even like building detail, you can't figure it out on one project. You do one project, you detail it, you learn from it, and then the next project you advance that detail, you learn from it, then you keep going and then you go. And when you look at something from an office like a Foster and many other ones, you see a building and you begin to appreciate the history and the level of iteration that required you to take to get a successful detail for that one particular project. So in that sense, to me, this building affects, like every project affects the next project. You know, let's make the details, let's resolve certain things better, um, both from a design perspective and from a constructability perspective. And that requires uh, a lot of discipline and a lot of experience and an incredible amount of staff that is kind of aware of that process, you know? Um, so uh, I, I think lineage, history, continuity is really important because if you want to keep making better work, uh, again, both conceptually and from a building point of view, you can't break that link. You know, you have to keep it continuous because through that continuity, you can advance uh, the work. Uh, so that's a bit of my answer uh, to your question. Yeah, it's, it's affected quite a bit, but I think every project really affects the next one in a really great way or hopefully a great way. Thank you. Thank you again so much for your time. Over to the professor, Purvis. Thank you very much, Tommy. Uh, UT uh, and really Scott, thank you so much. Uh, I have to just share one more one more thing before we sort of wrap up. Uh, when coming up with themes that seemed relevant for this seminar to focus on um, a series of buildings and reach out to the architects, uh, the 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 theme of climate and energy as as um, uh, as a professor putting together a syllabus, this was the hardest. Uh, of, the, of the six themes to actually find a really fantastic project. Um, and, I, and I say that mainly because, well, you know, seminal buildings like the, like the Bloomberg Center, which um, absolutely lives up to the, uh, the criteria that, that you're given by your client body of a, attaining net zero and all the different systems, often um, in projects that define themselves as sustainably performative or resilient or green, uh, not that these terms are interchangeable, uh, often buildings that make these claims and, and do perform so well, they suspend aesthetics, formalism, signature, uh, and as secondary or, or uh, you know, really um, secondary to the, the kind of main aims of, of, this, of the project that aspires as such. Um, and in, in some of the publications, uh, I recall reading a quote from Tom Main saying, uh, we don't design icons. And I find that a, a, you know, an interesting statement by uh, an architect um, uh, who, um, in terms of the Bloomberg Center, maybe not you know, the whole body of work, I don't want to make claims about icons and morphosis as a practice, but this seems to be an iconic, if I can use the sort of adjective rather than, than treating it as a noun, uh, this is an iconic building in terms of energy and climatic performance. Uh, and I'm wondering if you find that in any way either um, uh, congratulatory or offensive, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, uh... You know, when you're when you're in the middle of a process, you never start the process saying what we what we're going to end up with is we is an icon. Uh, just because you're kind of you know you're you're in the kitchen and you're cooking stuff, and uh, you know you, you your goal is not your goal is not to be I'm going to cook a Michelin five star, 
you start by just putting ingredients together and sort of seeing where it goes. And it's a little bit of an open-ended. So I think in that sense, it, it's not an icon because in our minds, we're just working and we're just doing what we need to do to kind of create a sense of uh, uh, something that's creative, uh, new, and it can meet the budget and the schedule, right? In a very like pragmatic kind of way. Uh, sometimes, of course, the, the only... The, and and really t t to us like the icon thing is not is not important at all. Uh, sometimes it is important to a client for various reasons uh, because they're interested in a certain kind of thing. I think certainly uh, our clients w would be coming to us for uh, for a reason and not somebody else. So that's 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 great. That's fun and and very fortunate for us. But yeah, but I think that the sort of yeah, one of the things I, I've kind of learned over the years that I learned from Tom Maine. Um, was really he's a he's an architect who kind of uh, worked very hard uh, for his success. Like he, he there were no shortcuts. Uh, he he just worked really really and to this day he just works crazy. Like he makes me feel like so relaxed. And I'm not saying from a, like an attitude. I'm talking about just from a creative mind. You know, like the, the level of energy that he has is is just amazing and and really uh, inspiring. So, you know, I, I think the 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 icon piece is always a little bit of a uh, of a of a thing for us. Uh, we don't try to go there. People, if somebody calls it, <laughs> I guess I guess maybe I'm not sure. But you know, as you know, these days nobody cares about icons. People care about performance. People care about the other everything but icon, you know. And and in many in many ways, we we feel the same the same way. You know, the world doesn't need another icon. The the, the world needs another really high performing, good space where you can be sane. It feels good being there, well being, and healthy. That's the most uh, important thing. I think on those terms, it, uh, the building also forecasts maybe the ways that uh, buildings have an, a, an have an impact on us and of our emotional and yeah. healthy well-being uh, yes. as performing well for the environment. And I think that's absolutely that's a value which I think the last year that certainly architecture has begun to embrace is the association between these different uh, areas of performance, between how we feel, absolutely. our own bodily health, uh, health of society, and health of the planet. So. Well, thank you so Absolutely. much for, for joining us. It's been a, a, a real pleasure to, to have you. You've given us a lot of your time. Um, and uh, I can't thank you enough. Um, and on behalf of uh, our school, our dean, our students, uh, wonderful to have you this morning. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks for having me. Guys, hang in there. Thank you. Thank you. A few more weeks. Talk to you soon. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for having me.